Good morning. Welcome to Tyndale Bible Church's second session. We're going to be studying Romans 8, verses 14 to 25. And I pray that you're all enjoying these teaching videos. And I know we're going to be glad to begin meeting together again, hopefully pretty soon. I miss you all very much. But before we begin, let us pray. <clears throat> Dear Father, these are hard times we find ourselves in. Any one of us at any time might find ourselves infected with this terrible virus. I lift all who can hear my voice, especially members of this local body and their families. I pray for um, their special divine, your special divine protection for all against this virus and complete healing for those who find themselves infected with it. Please bring every one of us back together well and healthy when we first are able to meet again. Let no one be absent. What a rejoicing that'll be. And speaking of rejoicing, I lift up uh, your word and pray that you bring home to us all the joy of knowing what your son Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. Paul is teaching us today about your provisions for victory over sin in our lives and how the Holy Spirit ministers to us as your children. And on this day that we celebrate your resurrection, let us remember the great joy of celebrating that which is the foundation of all that you have done for us. If you stayed in the grave, we would have nothing. But you didn't stay in the grave, and you rose from the dead, and your resurrection life is ours to identify with, participate in, and enjoy forever. And for that we praise you on this day. Amen. Let us recap for the purpose of maintaining context. In chapters 6 through 8, Paul describes the doctrine, the truths about what God has done for us through his Son, Jesus Christ, and what he continues to do for us through the indwelling Holy Spirit. Because of our new relationship to Christ, in chapter 6, we see that we are to consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to Christ. So we have a new relationship to sin. And we also find in chapter 6 that uh, we are to consider ourselves dead to the law and alive to God's grace. So we have a new relationship to the law. And that's especially talked about in chapter 7 where Paul explains why we are dead to the law in verses 1 to 13. We're not under the law because we have died to it, verse 4. And in verses 14 to 25, it illustrates the life of a believer who tries to live by the law. It's impossible. How then are we supposed to walk and to live? In chapter 8, we're to consider ourselves dead to the flesh and alive to the Holy Spirit. We see this in verses 12 to 13. Romans 8, 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. Again, it's not the law that sets us free from sin, but the Spirit of life in Christ. In chapter 8, Paul describes the power of the Spirit in the believer's life and how we are to relate to the Spirit as believers. In verse 4, believers walk according to the Spirit. And this is how we walk. Believers are according to the Spirit in, chapter, in verse 5. And this is who we are. Verse 6, believers' minds are set on the Spirit. We're spiritually minded. Verse 9, believers are in the Spirit. And this is where we are to abide. 9 to 11, we see the believers are indwelt by the Spirit. And this is where the Spirit abides. Verse 13, believers are by the Spirit putting to death the deeds of the body. In chapter 7, Paul proved that we are not under the law and illustrated the total failure of a believer who attempts to walk according to the law. And now, in the first half of chapter 8, he describes the power of the Spirit in our lives. But like Patrick said last week, there's more, much, much more that the indwelling Holy Spirit does for us. Today, we're going to learn that believers are led by the Holy Spirit. We're going to learn that believers are sons of God. 
And we're going to learn that believers are helped in our present suffering and future glory. And now that we have the context, let's begin with verse 14. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. First of all, believers are being led by the indwelling Holy Spirit. After believers come to Christ, the Holy Spirit continues to lead them in the moral will of God. The Holy Spirit leads every true child of God. We see that in Galatians 5.18. He goes before them and expects them to follow him as a shepherd expects his sheep to follow. However, we can choose to follow or not to follow him, to walk according to the Spirit or to walk according to the flesh. See that in verse 13. The Holy Spirit leads us objectively through the Scriptures and subjectively by his internal promptings. The Holy Spirit acts as a guide for the Christian by showing him or her the way to go. Like a guide goes before hikers on a mountain trail, blazing a safe path for them. However, as with the hikers, Christians do not have to follow their guide. We can turn aside, and sometimes do, taking a more dangerous path. This being led by the Spirit is what ties verses 1 to 13 together. Believers are spiritually minded, spiritually led, spiritually empowered. The Holy Spirit has all the resources of God dwelling in us. He has God's wisdom, God's resources, and God's enabling power. He knows God's moment-by-moment -moment will for us and therefore can lead and guide us in our moment-by-moment -moment walk. And this results in a walk that is pleasing to God. We are not to walk according to the law, and we are not to walk according to the flesh. We are to walk according to the Spirit. We see this expressed more in verse 15. For you have not received the spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you are received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. A slave obeys his master out of fear of punishment. The slave owner rules with a whip. A son obeys his father out of love for his father. Knowing that our Heavenly Father loves us, we should be able to return to him without fear when we sin and fall out of fellowship. Our Father will never reject us when we come to Him seeking acceptance. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So all it takes is a simple confession. In fact, we don't even have to pray for forgiveness, for He's already forgiven us. And we have no fear, only His amazing love. And how marvelous is the love of God for His children. Paul continues with the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives concerning us as God's children. Let's read verses 16 and 17. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may be also glorified with him. The question arises, how does the Holy Spirit testify to our spirit? And this, reverse, this verse refers basically only to the testimony that we receive as God's children. Any evidence as to our maturity is not referred to here. 1 John 5.10 may help with this. The one who believes in the Son of God has a testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. So it's not by revelation of new truth, it's not by inspiration, it's not always by assurance, it is not by a mere persuasion that we are elected to an eternal life. The Spirit illuminates God's word concerning his Son. If we understand and believe what God says concerning His Son, then we have received the testimony of the Holy Spirit with our spirit. And 1 Corinthians 12, 3 reminds us that it is not 
that it is only by the Spirit that one can say, Jesus is Lord. In verse 17, we're reminded that we are heirs. We inherit, along with Jesus Christ, our brother. We inherit both sufferings, now, as his disciples, and glory, most of which comes in the future. The phrase, if indeed, seeks to render the first-class condition of the Greek. Uh, that is, in this case, we could translate since. Just as surely as we share in his sufferings now, we also will surely be glorified with him. We will suffer together with him because of who we are. Sonship brings heirship, and it also identifies us as who we are. Together with Christ, we are sons of God, and because of that very thing, we will suffer together because of what that means. The world out there hates God, and it hated Christ. The world also hates all of God's children, simply because they're God's children. Why does the world hate me? Why does the world hate you? Just because of who you are. Suffering now brings glory later. And as we now suffer together with Christ, that we may later be glorified together with him, this indicates that present suffering is related to our future glory. No present suffering, no future glory. Verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Verse 18, actually in the Greek Bible, begins a new paragraph. I say this because it appears to sum up the last three verses, but actually it begins a follow-up thought to those verses, introducing a dialogue on suffering. Today's suffering is of little consequence when compared to our future glory. There's no comparison. You see, there's a cost for everything in life. Nothing is free. Every good thing has an upfront cost. Sometimes it costs us later, too. If we're willing to pay the price, we will enjoy what we purchased. People enjoy their purchase if they counted the cost beforehand and deemed it a good price. Well, Paul has counted the cost of his future glory with Christ. And the cost is today's suffering. He has counted it as definitely worth it. Actually, much more than worth it. It's like for a price of a used car, I end up with a brand new Rolls Royce. To Paul, today's suffering is nothing compared to the future glory with Christ. He wants that future glory, and he's willing to pay the price. This begs the question, when I am suffering today, should I be focused on my present suffering or on my future glory? Well, Paul runs a race looking to the goal, not looking at the pain of running. In Philippians 3.14 we read, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. In verses 19 to 22, Paul broadens his view from himself suffering to all of creation. Let's read. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation has subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. So Paul sees the whole of creation anxiously waiting for his future glory, just like we are. And that future glory is the revealing of the sons of God. We see this in verse 19. And then again in verse 21, where it awaits the glory of the children of God. So what is the glory of all creation, the future glory of God's children? Creation itself suffers greatly while waiting for our glory with Christ. Paul's purpose here is to let us know that the entire creation is suffering, not, not just us. Because of the fall, 
God subjected the whole creation to futility or frustration. Consequently, it never reaches the perfection that he originally intended it to achieve. Probably God is in view here as the one who did the subjecting, though Satan and Adam were instrumental in that action. The whole creation, that's excluding man, uh, as we see in 23, acts as though it is just going through birth pains and that it is straining to produce its fruit. And when the glory of the children of God is revealed, creation itself will be set free from its suffering. Let's read verses 23 to 25. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already has, what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. The saints share this sense of groaning and anticipation that Christ described that the whole creation is feeling. God will fully redeem both it and us finally. However, only the saints have the first fruits of the Spirit. The inner man has been redeemed. The inner man has been regenerated. We are new creatures in Christ. We alone, of all God's creation, have these first fruits to help us through our suffering as we groan within ourselves, waiting for our adoption as sons and the redemption of our bodies. And that testimony of the Holy Spirit that we are his sons, that we see in verse 16, is needed and very helpful in seeing us through. In the meantime, we should look forward with hope to what God has promised and patiently endure our present sufferings with perseverance. So what has he promised? He's promised our future glory together with Christ. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we shall be like. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. And in Romans 6, 5, we read, For if, you, if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So these two verses kind of say it all. It kind of sums it up real good. We look forward to being like him when he appears to come for us. We will see him as he is, the resurrected Christ, and we will be resurrected from these dead bodies of flesh, and we will be in a likeness of his resurrection. What a great promise. Remember that there is no future glory if Christ did not raise from the dead. Today we celebrate with believers all over the world the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The greatest and most glorious event in the history of God's creation is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The glory of the children of God that the whole creation awaits along with us is to be found in the resurrected Jesus Christ. But there is a prerequisite, prerequisite for resurrection. Death. Death comes before resurrection. So today, we will celebrate the death of Christ as well as his resurrection by observing together the Lord's Supper. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 11.27. In the email with the links to today's lessons, there was some uh, were instructions for you to have everything ready for this celebration. I trust that you have with you the bread and the drink. If not, then pause the video and make ready and then return to join us. We all may be viewing this video at different times during the day, maybe possibly on different days. But we are all celebrating together with the video. So think about that and know that we are together. The Lord's Supper is not a party. It's a serious celebration of the Lord's death. Let's look at verse 27 
where he gives us a warning about the seriousness of the celebration. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. But if we have judged ourselves rightly, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord in order that we may not be condemned along with the world. So let us observe a time of silence in order to judge ourselves rightly and confess anything that might be between us and our Savior. Paul says in verse 23, For I have received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. <coughs> Dear Jesus, just as we suffer together with you and we will be glorified together with you, we also together now remember that your body was broken for us. In remembering your death on the cross, we are reminded that you paid the price for our life. You redeemed us from the dead with your own death. For this we praise you and thank you for the gift and sacrifice that you gave for us. And in verse 25, in the same way he took the cup after also, after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And we again praise you, dear Father, dear Lord, for the sacrifice that you gave for us, your own life. You proclaim your sacrifice for our sins to the whole world, so that all who may listen may be saved by your death. We do this until you come for us. You rose from the dead and will come for us, and when we see you, we will be like you. For if we have been united with you in the likeness of your death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of your resurrection. And we want to thank you, Lord. We pray that you keep our minds focused on uh, your glory and our glory, the future glory, with you in a time of suffering that we're in now. We are imprisoned in our homes as a hidden enemy is lurking around every corner outside. Some of us have already lost friend or family member, and as we suffer in our lives, our hope is in you, the hope of glory. What is the hope of glory? He is risen. And everyone can say, he is risen indeed. And now that we have celebrated the Lord's Supper, and we've remembered his resurrection, let us end by singing a hymn of praise to our Lord. It'll come up on your screen with the lyrics and a slight introduction. And have a good week, everyone.